So this week we're continuing the teardown on the large Duval vertical mill. We're going to try to remove the knee of this machine so we can see just how badly damaged the knee and the saddle actually are. The dog's on the hunt. He's running back and forth, back and forth. And that's tight. The, the more I mess around with this machine, the more it kind of grows on me. Not that I don't like it, and I didn't like it when I first seen it, but you know, it just reminds me kind of of the 80s with its boxy uh, square design. It's well overbuilt, I'll say that. Every casting on this thing is thicker than you would think uh, you know, a, machine, a machine would be. So the weather's starting to turn around. Spring is definitely in the air. The trees are starting to get some buds and stuff on them. I'm noticing all of the bushes on the roadside are starting to get a green tint to them. It's still, we're still getting really cold nights, but the days are getting up in the 50s and 60s, which is nice, really nice after you know what we've had. Our winter wasn't all that bad, but it wasn't all that good either. So I'm excited for warm weather. Not excited about the bugs, but the mosquitoes. I don't mind the bugs. I do mind mosquitoes though. They wear me out. Come on. So if I can remember to put the footage in, I'll show you um, some of me and Al bringing this machine in here. It was quite, quite the job. It's heavy. Um, I don't know what it weighs exactly, but it's got some mass to it as you can imagine. Ready? Ready as it ought to be. This one front skate's moving as well. So I'm guessing this mill weighs somewhere in the four to five thousand pound range, which is pretty heavy for a vertical mill. And if you're not perfectly set up to move this kind of stuff, it's always just a slow, you know, couple inches at a time, back and forth, back and forth, adjusting and moving until you pretty much get it where you want it. So when it comes to moving equipment, I have relatively primitive tools. I have some machine rollers, I have a cable winch, I have a, obviously some chains and some straps and a big pry bar. And really you can get by with that, but it's not ideal. Even turning this machine 90 degrees to get it to face the direction that you want it to face I mean, can take 15-20 minutes if you're lucky. And all we're doing is kind of turning the rollers a bit, that way it kind of wants to scoot in the direction that we want to go and change our anchor point where we're hooking to this machine and pulling from to try to just coach it over in the direction that we wanted to go. It worked, but you know, it's slow. Well, 
can't see. If not, we can readjust. All right. If it dips at all, it's going to be on there quite hard. So the machine rollers that this piece of equipment sitting on at the moment are ones that I had built the night before I went and got my shaper. So probably seven years ago I built these four machine rollers in probably a couple hours. They were hacked together and I've been using them ever since. They really worked well. Let's see. That's good. That's good. That's sketchy. Yeah. I'd like a little bit more on there than a quarter. If possible. Ready? Yep. So in order to have something to pull from, I had to set a couple concrete anchors in the floor in the back of the shop to hook my electric winch to. Now, I wasn't too excited about drilling into this floor, but at some point I knew I was going to have to. And this winch is an amazing labor saver. I've actually used this exact winch to pull, I think, every piece of equipment that I've ever had, either up on a trailer or into the shop at some point or another. It's definitely a back saver, but eventually you run out of you know, room to work with it, and you gotta fall back on the old come along, which works just as well, but requires a little more effort. So after me and Al got this machine in place, we kind of just went over it, wiped it down a bit, just trying to get a better look at it, draining some of the oils out of it, and did a test run, stuff like that, just you know, an overview, trying to see what we had here. What are you doing, Chloe? Hmm? See Chloe? What are you doing? Did you hear that coon dog out there? Hmm? So another problem that this machine has that I forgot to mention last week is that the motor bearings that run the spindle are really bad. Let's see if I can get you to hear it. Hear that? The roaring? They're not supposed to sound like that. Now, I can take the belt off of this thing, spin the spindle, and it feels really good. Even at running, Running them together at high speed, the spindle feels and sounds okay, as far as I can tell. It's hard to hear the spindle independently of that noisy motor, but I believe that the spindle bearings in this are good, which is good. Everything on this mill, I believe, is going to have to come apart. There's so much of that dried up sticky oil from um, that cutting oil that they used just a varnish on everything. 
making everything tight and sticky. So I'll probably end up having to pull this whole thing apart, to be honest. Not that that's a bad thing. Really, be nice to pull it apart clean and inspect everything. That's kind of the, the thought. I got more room to work here. I can lift, well, yeah, this will probably come off the front so I can use the cherry picker and just slide it off there without running into the, the head of this machine. So I need to get started pulling apart the gearbox that's on the front of this machine. Now this is an oil field gearbox. There's your sight glass and your oil fill. This box is powered by a drive shaft that runs in the back of it that comes from this uh, speed selectable gearbox here that just powers your uh, auto feeds and these are the selectors that turn your auto feed on or off and then we have the sump controls So there'll be a series of gears in here uh, This is the back of the lead screw probably just a bearing cap because the lead screw is going to run directly under the saddle And then this is your manual input control that probably just a gear here and a gear here with a left-handed lead screw That's what I'm just thinking out loud, right? We have two dowel pins that keep this case front in alignment and then we have all the fasteners that hold the case front on. It's a pretty thick uh, front case. Uh, these may be jack screws is what I'm thinking to help separate the front of this case from the back of the box. And then a couple of screws here that are probably just ball detents or double set screws to hold these handles in. So I got to pull the electronics out of this as well. I'm not for sure. Maybe it'll come apart without taking this front stuff off, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe it will have to come apart. <laughs> I don't know. So everything's going to have to come apart. It's just what order is that going to occur in. So I'm going to pull apart this first, get the electronics out of here, then we'll start pulling out these fasteners. So behind the manual input handle for the Y-axis, 
there's a gear like I thought and then there's a uh, cage needle bearing so it doesn't have to come off that's good so very little wear inside here anything obvious anyway and shockingly clean but it is a low speed gearbox that's probably overbuilt a uh, factor of three Hold on to that. Just hold it down on this corner. You got it? Yeah. Don't put your feet under it. That's good enough. You can let go of it. Thank you, love. Mm hmm. In that box. Huh? I'm gonna wait to email that lady. On the I'm desk? Yeah, I'm gonna leave a little area of the floor. Stop by Peddler's Mall to see if they have any old wooden ones there first. Yeah, we'll Not find. Then. We'll find you a nice desk, oh. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. These are just the closest ones. And that's the nicest one out of the Okay. So let's get a look at the bottom of the saddle. 
it's in pretty bad shape. So check out how bad the machine weighs on the bottom of the saddle are. Both of these surfaces are, are smoked. It's about as bad as I think I've ever seen. I don't know that it gets a lot worse than this. Uh, but the good thing is it really doesn't matter. Uh, to be honest, this can be ground just to get it good and flat. You, don't even, you wouldn't even have to necessarily grind below the uh, scoring because you can apply turkite, which is a machine way rebuilding surface or some machines come brand new with it on and it's just a material that adheres to this you scrape that in flat and uh, you know be good to go last forever so it is bad that is for sure very bad So for a little over a month now, we've had the Starlink system installed at the at the house and shop here. And before, we were using an alternative internet provider that really always seemed to give us the runaround. And this is a day that I've been waiting on for a long time. So Starlink's been working out really good. We haven't had almost no issues at all. Every once in a while, our internet signal will drop out with the Starlink, but it's for minutes usually versus our old provider which hardly worked at all and uh, completely satisfied with the Starlink system so it's out with the old provider they will no longer be getting any more of my money they were really interested to to help solve the internet issues I had with this system when I called them to uh, cancel the service but every call that I made prior to that uh, the problems were on my end obviously they tried absolutely everything to get me to keep this system, but I'll be honest, I wouldn't keep the system if it was absolutely free. It is that bad compared to the Starlink system, in my opinion. Uh, it, just light years better. Uh, going from 220p loading every five seconds to multiple people watching 4K videos. And, uh, you know, a more reliable service, even when the weather's bad. I've been meaning to get internet out at the shop as well, uh, but I've just been so busy lately I haven't had a chance to do that. I'm really looking forward to potentially live streaming out of the shop and just checking in a little more often. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Get this other one down too. Um, I don't know how that <laughs> it's all right. So underneath this tarp is a few things that I'm going to be adding to the shop and I want to share it with you. I'm kind of excited about this even though it's a simple item. So let me show you. So check out the new shop cabinets. Probably straight out of the 70s or 80s I would guess. I got six of these out of a dumpster actually and I'm really glad to add them to the shop. Although they're not very attractive with their current paint job. They're really well made, and I wouldn't be surprised to open these up and see burnt orange shag carpet inside lining the shelves, but they can always be painted. Let me show them to you, I'm glad to have them. So check out how nice these are made. Really thick, heavy doors. Um, definitely an industrial type cabinet. It's nice. You can't have too much cabinet space. And this takes advantage of space that's usually up on the walls that doesn't get utilized in a lot of shops. So I've got six. They're a few different sizes, but I'll figure out a layout and where I'm going to put them in the future. Maybe give them a paint job. This slanted top comes off of them. Man, I'm glad to have those. Nice. So I got two pieces of viewer mail here that I want to share with you real quick. This stuff just arrived. We have a Jacobs 14N Super Ball Bearing Chuck, a Morse Taper number 4 to Jacobs Taper number 3 Arbor. And this was sent by Thomas Domingo out of Florida along with a complete rebuild kit for the 14N Chuck. He's seen last week where I was mentioning uh, wanting to get a uh, or needing a Morse taper number four to fit directly in the tailstock of my lathe and he said he had like 10 or so of these chucks that he had bought in a lot and decided he'd send me one so thank you Thomas I definitely appreciate that and I'll put that to use and the second gift is not machine tools but it is definitely really neat let me read the letter to you first at least some of it Hello Steve, my name is Scott Volage. I'm a huge fan of the videos and like how you work with what you have and make the most of what you can. 
For 16 years, I was a licensed master plumber and pipe fitter, heater, or boiler installer. I totally get the learning a bit of many different trades and being able to do a bit of everything. Always had a passion for machine tools, but chose a different trade back in high school. Back 20 years ago, I started going to living history events and would make a large supply of beef jerky and trade for what I wanted or needed while at these events. I love beef jerky, by the way. I sent two bags. He did. I've already tore into the uh, not hot bag, and it is awesome, by the way. Um, goes on talking about one, you know, is teriyaki in Worcestershire, another is uh, uh, teriyaki and Frank's extra hot. Uh, so I'll tear into that other bag once this one's gone. He sent a tomahawk head, which is awesome, and a sheath. It's a nice looking tomahawk. Um, sent a handle as well. So I appreciate that. And he says, tomahawks are handy tools and fun as hell to throw. I am now unable to do many of the things I, I used to be able to do having become disabled. But the good Lord woke me up today and I get to watch you and several other YouTubers doing the kinds of projects I wish I could still do. God bless and have a good day. So, man, how, how awesome is that? So, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Thomas. I'll uh, snack on this beef jerky in the shop because it is the perfect shop snack, in my opinion. So in case you haven't noticed, there are hundreds, potentially over a thousand parts that I've disassembled so far, if you're including the nuts and bolts. And each one of these parts kind of needs to be looked over and inspected and cleaned because it's not going to get any easier than it is at this moment with everything disassembled to get everything clean. And I'm going to try my best to get you know, everything in as good a shape as it can be without go into extremes on this thing while this thing's apart and the parts are out for shipping or shipping while the parts are out for grinding you know just the time to clean everything is now when it's easily accessible so here's a look at the big cast iron bracket that holds the two acme nuts that for the y-axis so the lead screw from the saddle goes through this nut and the, that transfers into movement of the saddle and it's adjustable you can see there's a nut here and a nut here this one is stationary so it's got two screws in it and then this one has two screws but the nut is slotted so if i want to change the timing between this nut and this nut i can simply by loosening these screws and adjusting this nut and all that does is take any slop in this nut out so there's no back removes the backlash out of the y-axis uh, acme uh, screw now i'm not for sure exactly what this part of the nut is other than just a bushing that the table lead screw runs through probably just to keep that lead screw running straight and keep it from bowing that's what i'm thinking but anyway that's a big heavy duty bracket for holding that nut and uh, it looks okay there is some 
some scoring inside of the nut, which you would expect. It's going to pick up some dirt and stuff and pull it in there. But I'm just going to call that good because it didn't feel bad you know, when I moved it back and forth. So there, that is done and clean. So in last week's video, when I revealed the big dual milling machine, the new one, I said, somewhat jokingly, but not completely, that my other milling machine was absolute garbage. And I had some viewers think I was referring to the K&T mill, the horizontal mill on the other side of the shop. And I was not. It's actually in perfectly uh, good condition, especially for its age. I was referring to my, hor or my vertical mill here. This is an X-Acto 9 by 42 it's one of the very first machines I ever got, and I've used it quite a bit. A lot of people have seen me make a, quite a few parts on this thing. It is a perfectly usable machine, although it does have wear in every place that's possible to wear in. But you can make good parts on it. You just got to be careful. Now, another thing that's wrong with this, other than the wear, is that all of the guts for the power down feed have been removed on this machine. It was like that when I got it, so it does not have any of the components for the power down feed. It doesn't work, which is not a big deal because most people don't use that anyway. Now, this is going to be in my way pretty much when I get the big do-all back together. And after I get that big do-all sorted and where it's usable, I'm going to be getting rid of this machine. Now, I don't want to sell it. I don't want a penny for it. In fact, I want to give it away. And I'm going to give it away to one of my patrons that is interested in it, that's close enough to to come get it, I'll help you load it on your pickup truck. And if none of my patrons want it, then I'll just give it away to a viewer. But we're going to wait until the do is back together because I still I need a machine to use until that that happens. I am keeping the vice, but I will give away a set of RA collets with it as well. And somebody can get a perfectly usable machine that may spark their interest in the machining hobby, uh, just like this machine actually did for me. And even if you want a super drill press, you know, that would function as that as well. Uh, also, I want to get rid of the drill press here because now I have the functional do-all drill press over in the corner and I don't need this thing anymore. So same deal, although it can go away at any time because I don't need it at all. So any of my patrons who are interested in this drill press, just send me a message through patrons saying I want it and it can be yours. I'll help you put it in your truck. So that's the deal. I, really don't need this stuff sitting in my way and if I can pass on the favor uh, to those who have helped me then I will do that so that's the deal not keeping everything can't do it well I've ran into a little bit of a snag on this project and I was hoping to get the knee off of this machine get it cleaned up get everything that needs to be ground crated up and you know ready to be sent off but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to get the knee of this machine off at least uh, not safely anyway. Yeah, could I get it off of here? Probably so, but I don't want to risk damaging it because it has to be lifted all the way up off of these dovetail ways. This part does not come off forward. So it really has to be lifted seven, seven feet at least, probably seven and a half feet in the air before it'll come off of this, uh, the ways of this machine. And if I damage either one of those in the process, it just totally scraps this whole project and we don't want to do that. Now I could probably lift this with the with the trusses but of this roof but it's just not designed for that the roof or the the truss so we're not going to do that i can't use the cherry picker because it does not come in close enough nor does it lift high enough to get this thing off and i can't use the electric forklift because it doesn't come in close enough and it doesn't have proportional control if you push the button on that electric forklift it either lifts you know, 100 mile an hour, or not at all, right? There's no control over it. It's just up or down, and that's it. And I want to be able to lift this off in a controlled manner. That way I don't bind it and break anything. And I want the process of reassembling this machine to go smoothly as well without damage. So i got to get the right tool for the job, which I should have next week, and I'm not going to spoil it and tell you what it is. Some of you guys will probably put the pieces together, but that's what I'm waiting on. I wish I could get this off this week, but it's just not going to happen. Um, not without high risk of damage anyway. So that's it. We're going to clean this thing up as best as we can and just wait till we get the right tool.
before we try to pick it off of here. So warning, this is going to be a little long-winded. Um, I want to give my viewers an update on where I'm at as far as the shop status. Getting back to doing some machine work and stuff in here because I really look forward to that. And I spent part of my week working my way around the shop, getting stuff cleaned back up and hooked back up as far as equipment. So at the moment, I can use my shaper. I can use my big lathe. I can use my old uh, vertical mill. I can use the KNT mill as well, although it does need a little more cleaning. I can't use my surface grinder and I can't use my cutter grinder yet. They're not hooked up, so still a little work to do with that. And stuff has to be positioned, but in the meantime, I hooked everything up back up. That way I can at least use it until I get stuff sorted. Now I spent half of my week, my available time this week anyway, working on the do all vertical mill that we just got because the sooner I get that stuff cleaned up and sent off, the sooner I can get it back and get those parts off the floor, get that mill back assembled and start using it and then get rid of my other horizontal or vertical mill and make some space in here. I'm also going to be getting rid of a small air compressor and my small cutter grinder because I don't need two of those. And, uh, you know, we'll talk more about that later, but I am going to downsize a little bit as far as excess equipment in here. Um, now that the cover's done for the rotary phase converter and the air compressor, I really need to focus on getting electricity out there to that to air compressor so I can take advantage of the airline that I ran in the shop. And I have, I believe, I have everything that I need in order to hook that thing up as far as components, uh, but I'm not an electrician. Uh, I'm not Big Clive. Some of you, I'm sure, watch Big Clive. He's got a YouTube channel. It's bigclive.com. He's a friend of mine and an amazing electrician. I love listening to that guy explain all the things about electronics that I don't understand. I am better at electronics because of him. I understand a lot more than what I did, although still, I'm not an electrician. So I'm going to need some help. I'm either going to hire somebody to help me hook up this box it is a disconnect and a starter for the air compressor or maybe a viewer uh, potentially that's local would be interested in coming and helping me out uh, doing it i'm not for sure one way or another before too long i'd really like to get that air compressor up and running um i've also got a new tool here that i want to share with you i'm really excited to add it to the shop it really adds a lot of capabilities to the shop and uh, if nothing else you'll find it interesting so let me show it to you i'll explain what has to happen before i can use it and uh, maybe some of you have never even seen this tool and didn't even know it exists. So here's a new tool that I am extremely excited to add to the shop. It is a Teradyne 2000 Eutectic Spray Welder. Now, if you've watched the YouTube channel ABOM79, you, chances are you've seen him use this exact model. Now, this model of spray welder has been around for almost 40 years, I believe. I talked to Dave over at Eutectic and uh, you know we just discussed the use of this thing you know some of the applications where these things are really suited and building up boiler walls where you know they've uh, you know corroded away building up crankshafts not on the throws of a crank but on the main main bearing journals motor parts in general building up bearing journals on shafts that are worn I mean you could potentially save a shaft that's worth you know, thousands of dollars by the spray weld process where potentially arc welding, stick welding or TIG welding puts so much heat into the part that you risk warping it or damaging it further. Uh, this is a process where it takes a fine metal powder, it goes down through the torch, gets shot out of the end into an oxygen and acetylene flame and basically builds up a worn surface by depositing that powder you know, on the surface, then you machine it back down to whatever the factory specs are. So it's a really neat process, and uh, talking to the manufacturer was really uh, eye-opening on how many things can be repaired with one of these. It's just a proven process. It's been around forever. This particular torch is like in like new condition, which is extremely rare to find on the used market because new, this kit still runs anywhere from seven to $9,000, which is really expensive. But if you can imagine some of the things that you could save uh, with this, it could pay for itself relatively quickly if you had the work. 
Uh, this was not, it, nothing like that was paid for this thing. This was a cheap auction score that my buddy Al picked up at the same auction where he got the uh, uh, do-all mill, and I appreciate it uh, more than you can imagine. It was just luck, really, finding this thing in this condition for the price that it was picked up for. I'm not going to tell you, you'd be angry. It was that cheap for this thing. So I'm excited to have it. I can't wait to use it. Teradyne Eutectic offered me to send this whole kit back to them. They're going to go over everything in it, completely replace all the O-rings, make sure everything's working the way that it should, and then they're going to help me get some of the consumables and some of the other parts of this kit that I need in order to demonstrate this on the channel. It's kind of exciting, and I can't wait to show this um, and get back to doing some metal work in the shop. So, man, nice kit. Can't wait to use it. And you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys would like to see it be used as well. Well, guys, I think that's it. Hopefully everybody had a really good week. I know that the weather around here has been pretty good, and that's exciting that things are starting to warm up a bit. Hopefully you can see that I've made a little more progress cleaning this thing up, and the paint... Is surprisingly good under all that crime, all that grime, and uh, chances are I won't won't even paint this thing. But I have decided that I'm going to pull the head off and go through it to make sure that it's not damaging itself because it's a little, it's not a little, it's quite sticky, and it's got some oilers on it that I don't trust are working the way that they should, and it doesn't make sense, right, to do all this and not pull the head off. Got to change the motor bearings as well. I was hoping, like I said, to get this off, but with the tools that I have, I just cannot, can't safely pull it off without risk of damaging it and scrapping the whole project. And then all my time up to this point would be wasted, so I'm not going to do that. We'll get the right tool for the job, and then it'll be much easier to go back together as well. So excited that I'm able to use some of my machine tools again as well. Things are really starting to come together now, although, you know, still got a lot to do. So... That's it for this week anyway. So huge thanks to anybody who supported me on this project. It is much appreciated. Viewers, patrons, subscribers. That's it. So thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.